conference, our May conference, Expanding Democracy in an Age of Polarization and Resistance. I would welcome you not just to Pendle Hill, but if you are traveling from afar, or maybe even if you're not, and say welcome to the Lenape Hoking. The land that Pendle Hill is situated on is part of a broad expanse of the Lenape people that were our original inhabitants of this area all along the Delaware River. Uh, Delaware, New Jersey, parts of New York up to New York City and all through this part of eastern Pennsylvania along the Delaware River and its tributaries. And so it's good for us to remember that this land was hunted and fished and cultivated by the Lenape, who, despite the thoughts of many people, are still among us in this particular area. There are three recognized tribal nations two in Delaware and one in New Jersey that have been continuously self-governing for over 300 years. So well before we um, got here as immigrants or as people who were brought, our ancestors were brought here against their wills. And it's good to remember that. So I'd invite you into a period of worship and then we're going to have some music brought to you by City Love. And there's a great name for our friends Sterling Duns or Dwight Dunstan, Caselli Jordan or Brian Jordan, depending on whether they're at work or, or playing with us. And um, there are two teachers and school administrators, Brian teaches kindergarten, and what a great, gentle spirit to have guiding young folks. You will be honored to hear him. And Dwight um, is teaching a James Baldwin course and is going to be teaching it with Jan Karsten this summer to the folks from the um, Chester Youth Choir in their summer program, which is delightful. And I know you're excited about teaching, but also is um, in the admissions office at Friends Central School. So out of the silence, when you're ready to go, you just give us some music when you're ready, OK? Let's settle into silence.
Pokemon cards and shards on the thieves at the street of grown-ups. Venues and bars packed with supporters. Yo, it's so nuts. I spent a few summers in New Hampshire camping. I hope my goodwill in the heart offsets all the mistakes that I've been making. Forgot the callback, plan fail, what's the fallback? I had none, but I got popcorn and all the seasons of all that. Kenan and Kelly had to start killing it. I knew they were feeling it, had to look in the mirror to see who I was dealing with. If you're not safe in your own skin, finding bliss is like finding one apple in all of the ocean, it's a hard task. He who laughs first, don't laugh last, unless they were lowering their hats to deal with cold hard facts. I dream of a world that's euphoric and is so far fetched. I just hope that we make it before warm hearts hard end. James Harden, yeah, we rocking straight to the top. It's a shame if you can't play, stand a plane ride. But imagine being in the cockpit. I know it's hard. We're earthbound, dreaming no stars. Thinking that it's too far, it'll never be ours. I'm here to tell you that together love can open way to deepest regions of oceans, vastly reaching the outer space. Nothing's an obstacle, no vision unobtainable. Don't believe in impossible, nothing will be the same with you. And nothing will be the same with us. And all it took was a little trust. All these black lives, they matter, they matter to me. All this grief in the streets, man, it's so hard to breathe. Got our hands up, don't shoot, we are humanity. We want peace. And it's hard to believe, is it me? It's getting harder and harder to breathe Feeling steeped in the heat of it all Hell, we've been doomed and gloom Since the first fall, man, I call that a fail And for whom does the bell toll? And for whom does the toll bell? And who really was Sean Bell? What if he lived to be 84? And what if Mike had 80 more? Birthdays, y'all, I want change in the worst way These next names got fame in the worst way Boy, Grant, Renisha, I can't keep going I feel the tears coming in my ears flowing Stress got me reaching for my higher calling But am I a dead man for being black and walking? Profilers, we need a moral compass We need to keep bending it towards the arc of justice Come on! Now the shooters didn't care, they leave Both the sterling and the level I can't breathe We need justice But if Freddie Bray was white like me Do you think those officers would still be free? Justice. Sometimes I imagine being in the skin of my white kid As a young boy, growing up on the other side of town With no blacks around, my only source of the light The surround sound TV and watching cops didn't make sense But my pop said that was just evidence And he was a cop on the black box, wanted to be him I grew up, became a policeman for five years I fought crime with a partner back to back Till some hung shot up him in the neck I never forgave the streets that raised the creek. My vision was bleak, I couldn't sleep. I'm on my nine to five, hit this crack spot. Busted these clowns before, they want more, I'll give them more. I kick in the door, my gun is drawn. I see someone that looks like me, walks like me, talks like me. I catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror, or putting this gun. Am I the one they should be fearing? It couldn't be any clearer. I see a picture of a mother with a kid around the neck holding them. We all want to be free For so long my dad's words were so strong And my partner who got killed and some bad he's gone But these people on the problem There's something deeper at work Something great to put on us at birth I can't explain it And I can't maintain it But for some reason now I feel like singing But I can't explain it I can't maintain it But for some reason now I feel like singing Come on! All these black lives in In black culture, why does one get love when the other's supposed to? All this grief in the streets, man, it's so hard to breathe. It's too much to even fathom. We're going backwards with all this violent action. Got our hands up, don't shoot. We are humanity. My hands up, so we don't shoot. Me. Cause you're me, and I'm you. All these black lives, they matter, they matter to me. Now with black lives, in black culture, why does one get love when the other's supposed to? All this grief in the streets, man, it's so hard to breathe. It's too much to even fathom. We're going backwards with all this violent action. Got our hands up, don't shoot. Got our hands up, don't shoot. Got our hands up, don't shoot.
first speaker. Good evening, friends. That's why we settled into silence, because we're about to do some hard work. And the hard work is, as Neonu Span has told us many a time, is heart work. So heart work, hard work, and then some footwork to get us on the move. Um, our original topic for this series was to be serve and protect whom from what? Who do you serve? Who do you protect? Um, and when it became apparent from the day of his election probably, but certainly from the day of his inauguration when closer ties with the military, increased funding for militarization of the police departments, and uh, a signal that the Department of Justice was no longer going to be monitoring the cities um, and seeking consent decrees as they have um, in the Obama administration uh, became apparent. It seemed that we needed to look both at the violence, this is a good time to suggest folks to turn off their cell phones or put them in the silent mode. I better do that myself. Okay, good. Everybody do that. And it, it became apparent that we wanted to make our subject a bit broader in terms of how we as people who are concerned with the direction that our country has taken, the turns that it has taken, to come together in a broader coalition, not minimizing, diminishing, or in any way undercutting the strength of Black Lives Matter and the courageous stand that they have taken in confronting the police, but how can we stand with allies as comrades willing to take risks to be with people who are endangered by our society? Muslims, women, LGBT people, blacks, immigrants, we're all targeted groups. And how can we tell our stories in a more dramatic way to engage a broader part of our electorate in the action to bend that arc of justice which will take all of our shoulders to bend it, the arc of the moral compass towards justice as our City Love friends just reminded us. So we expanded our view towards how do we talk to our neighbors, our friends? How do we not just talk within our concerned silos? How do we break away from our fear and start to take the courageous steps that we're going to need to do? Whether your courageous step is engaging the person on the bar stool next to you the next time you're at Iron Hill, which might be me, or it might be somebody in your book club or your church, or it might be someone of in your own family, perhaps, who has not um, heard your story and why you feel that the country is taking a seriously disastrous turn with a history behind it. So tonight we're very 
honored privilege to have with us the Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler um, as our opening speaker addressing our conference theme on expanding democracy in an age of polarization and resistance. Uh, Dr. Tyler currently serves as the 52nd pastor of Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Many, many of you know this as the church founded by um, Bishop Richard Allen, and it's the beginning of the American Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia back at the turn, uh, late, late part of the 18th century, and has been going strong ever since. Um, Reverend Tyler is a very strong voice and advocate for racial justice within Philadelphia, but is also co-chair of the um, Clergy Caucus of Power, which stands for Philadelphians Organized to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild. So focusing on our urban life with an interfaith coalition that is interracial, cuts across class lines, and addresses multiple issues that affect all people. Concerned about the state of our public school systems, concerned about gun violence, supporting Black Lives Matter, and working for fighting for 15 for fair living wage for all people. So I'm not going to go through all of the honors that he has uh, accumulated over the years, but he is an orator that stands for justice. And he's also a documentarian and has done a documentary on Bishop Richard Allen's life. So beyond the pulpit, and beyond the bullhorn in the streets is an artist who does documentary films. So please give a warm welcome to Reverend Mark Kelly Tyler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, thank John for that kind introduction and uh, Thanks to all of you as well uh, for being here on tonight. Uh, it's not something that you have to do. I want to certainly thank the uh, folk here at Pendle Hill for all that you have done. And I want to thank uh, also the Reverend Greg Holston, who was supposed to be here, uh, who's one of uh, our co-laborers in power. He's our new executive director, but long before that was uh, just a part of the clergy with myself organizing. Um, so. Uh, I'm here trying to stand in his shoes tonight, so I want to thank him for uh, making this opportunity possible. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, when I saw the theme, I actually said, well, this is something I can get excited about. Normally when somebody passes some work on to you, uh, something that they, <laughs> that they really don't want to do, but he truly had a conflict and uh, wanted to be here as well. And so uh, I want to just talk tonight a little bit uh, really about the theme uh, that that um, you all are going to be wrestling with over the next few days, uh, democracy, uh, expanding democracy in the age of polarization and resistance. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful theme. In fact, John uh, emailed me and asked uh, what the topic, uh, the title of my speech was going to be. I said, I'm not going to mess up that perfect theme, <laughs> you know, because I'm sure somebody agonized over it. Uh, have you, has anyone here ever worked on a theme before? I mean, <laughs> you lose friendships over trying to develop a theme, trust me. And so uh, because they put together such a wonderful uh, theme, I thought it best to really just stick with that topic uh, because I think it speaks in so many ways to the times uh, that we're in, but also points forward, um, I believe, as well, uh, into what we ought to be thinking about. So uh, I'm a preacher by um, calling, uh, but I don't expect to preach tonight, so I actually have something prepared here for you. Not that I don't prepare sermons, but they, they never quite stick. 
you know, go exactly the way you plan. Halfway through, you just kind of find yourself somewhere. You don't know how you got there. Uh, but I know how to time sermons, and uh, so I've, I'm not so sure about the speech. So I've got a little timer here. I want to leave some time available for us to uh, have Q&A. Now, I also recognize that we're live streaming this event, and people may be videotaping. So uh, some of the persons I may talk about, I might um, change the names, or it may be kind of vague. Uh, because some of these things, especially local concerns, are things that we're still working through. And uh, as you know, um, relationship building is difficult. And even sometimes with opponents, uh, you don't want to antagonize people uh, for no, um, just for no reason. So understand if I'm being a little vague, uh, it's for a purpose. Uh, because again, some of these things are unresolved. So as I thought about your theme, uh, John, you know, the first thing that popped into my mind, ironically, uh, was not necessarily democracy, uh, but it was um, a couple of barbers who graduated from, you know, barber school back in around 1900. And I know it doesn't quite sound like your theme, um, but just follow me. Uh, these two barbers graduated from school. They learned how to cut hair. They learned how to line up the rough edges, you know, learned all the things that a barber needs to know. They struck out and decided they wanted to, you know, team up and go out together, find a town where one could work one side of the town and one could work the other side. Now these two barbers finally found a town and they thought it was the perfect place. They got a hotel room, each got their own room and got up the next morning and they just went out on their own and ventured through the town to see what they could see. Both of them discovered that to their amazement, there was not one barber at all in the town. On top of the fact that there was no barber, nobody, nobody, I'm telling you, just looking around at the town, no one had had a haircut in years. <laughs> all of the beards were long, all of the hair was long. I mean, just, it was not what they expected. Both of them went back to their rooms that night, and each of them uh, discovered that what they saw that day had a profound impact on them. So they sat down and, because it was 1900, not 2017, they couldn't text anybody or call anyone. They sat down and each of them wrote home to their families. The first one wrote home and said, Mom and Dad, I have made a terrible mistake. Should have never left home and I should have never come here. I've come to a place where, first of all, there is no barber. Folk have not even heard of a barber. They don't know what it is. And worse than that, nobody here ever gets their hair cut. And on and on and on he went, writing to his parents about his decision to pack up and go back home. The other barber in his room wrote to his parents, but he was just the opposite. Started to write, and I mean, you could almost see and feel the enthusiasm coming off of his pen as he wrote. He said, Mom and Dad, you're not going to believe what I found. I found a town that has no barber in it, and everybody in the town needs a haircut. <laughs> He says, Mom and Dad, I guarantee you by next year I'm going to be a rich man. And I want you to remember these two young barbers as we think about the theme tonight. I mean, really, I want you to keep these two barbers uh, in your head as we think about what it means to expand democracy in an age of polarization and resistance, because I think their parable speaks to us in this moment. Some people might look at this moment that we're living in and like the first barber, throw up their hands in despair and declare that there's nothing worth fighting for because democracy doesn't live here anymore. But others will be like the second barber and see the landscape in front of us not as something that we ought to walk away from, but really something that we ought to embrace as an opportunity for the expansion of democracy. Now, I get it for people who say that uh, democracy is in trouble. I mean, I agree with that. I've been in protest. I was at a rally in a protest at 4.30 today in front of the school district with high school students who were demonstrating for their right to expand the complaint process. And so if you say democracy is in trouble, you get no argument from me. There are plenty of reasons to throw up our hands in defeat. And I mean, in fact, if you just listen or watch cable news for an hour, um, you'll need a therapist by the time you get done with Chris Matthews or anybody else. There are those who are like that first barber who are rightly concerned about the world in which we live in. 
consider for a moment the state of politics today and politicians, elected officials who are elected so-called to represent us. We have an administration in Washington, D.C. Um, and I can just say dot, 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 and you can fill in the rest. But let's just talk about the, the media and the press for a moment. Uh, we have an, a president who, like the emperor with his new clothes, uh, that anyone who tells him anything contrary to what he wants to hear uh, is deemed to be a traitor. And as Jim Comey found out this week, um, will soon find themselves looking for a new job. When have you ever heard of the press being barred from the White House? A, a, a press secretary who has press conferences with selected members of the media on call and persons who have given them a hard time are not allowed in the press briefing, but others are to report back to him or to her. We've got a secretary of state who travels now across the world to other governments on our behalf, but only takes one reporter the one who writes all the favorable things about the White House administration, and no other persons in the press corps get to travel with him. The silencing of the press ought to concern us, because that's how dictatorships get started. In fact, it's not just in Washington, D.C., and there's so much we could talk about in D.C., uh, but that would be to miss the point, because it's also in Harrisburg. Unresponsive politicians who overreach, and uh, I find it funny that um, Harrisburg, and when I lived in New Jersey, it was the same thing when I pastored in Camden, uh, because there the state had taken over that city as well, that when cities tip to a black majority, seems that all of a sudden they can't run themselves anymore. And it's not just in Harrisburg, it's even in the cities that we live in, in the townships that we live in. Um, we sat before uh, a certain elected official one time, our group power, when we first began organizing around the airport. Um, there was a campaign that we launched into and we discovered that there was a, supposed to be a $6 billion airport expansion with the runways and the terminals and everything else. So some of that work has been done. Uh, and yet, to our dismay, many of the workers who were wheelchair pushers and baggage handlers at the Philadelphia airport, the folk that check your stuff in and that push you to and fro, uh, were not even making the minimum wage, they were making in some cases two to four dollars an hour. Now I know you're saying that's, that, is, that can't be true. I'm telling you, we sat and spoke with them and talked with union organizers and they were so-called tip jobs, but they could not ask for tips. This is at the Philadelphia airport. And so these are persons who were making less than seven an hour and would be fired if they left early. So when the planes that we fly on came in late and we misconnected or the weather pushed us back, and you want to know why they look so angry when they're standing in the jetway at 1 o'clock in the morning? Because they know I can't get the SEPTA train home now. And so somehow with the pennies I've made today, I've got to figure out how I'm going to get home and who's going to take care of my child. I mean, just an absolute mess at the airport when we waded into it. And so power got together, and it's not just a clergy group, it's clergy and lay, we joined as congregations, but a group of clergy went to go speak to a certain elected official who was high ranking about the airport. Now, I never will forget um, the first meeting. As so we sat down with this elected official, it was a small room, um, kind of a long table, there may have been about 10 of us and 10 of you know this person's uh, people around him. And as we sat there talking, uh, one of our pastor leaders, uh, Reverend Zach, uh, asked a question and the person started to answer and started giving the political speech, you know, to kind of run the clock out. We'd say we're going to have an hour, so I guess they figured if we just talk long enough, we'll filibuster and the hour will be up and we can go on without ever answering the question. About two or three minutes into that, Reverend Zach stopped him and said, excuse me, that's not what I asked you. Answer the question that we asked, because we don't have all day. The, the elected official sat back in his chair, and I'm telling you, boy, if you could, I mean, it was the look of evil on his face. It was a, in fact, it was almost, without saying if I had to caption it over his head, it was, how dare you? You know, who do you think you are questioning me? Your, your preachers, your rabbis, your imams, 
you, you don't know about this stuff. This is, we're talking about, at that time, U.S. Air. This is big money, and the federal government is bringing money in. You don't even know what you're talking about. You are out of your league. This is not your business. We call you to bless the food. We call you to pray at council. We call you for the benediction and to say nice words when people pass. This is not your place. The second time we met with them, uh, with a larger group, that time they took us into a different room, and the table was huge and imposing. They're meant to intimidate us. And all the elected officials sat at the front, and they put us down on the ends. And by the time it was over, after they got done talking to us the way they did, I said, you know, brothers and sisters, I feel like Moses and Aaron, when they went to go talk to Pharaoh the first time, and said, God said, let my people go. But instead of getting the answer they wanted or expected, Pharaoh took away the straw and made things worse. I mean, it was, it, it, I can't even begin to really just explain, you know, enough to you how they, how they tried to make us feel. Now, they didn't make us feel that way because we understood who we were and, and the place that was ours, that that was our city hall. And that those are our elected officials. And that your salary comes from our tax dollars. We all pay wage taxes. We all pay property taxes. In fact, when I was assigned to the pastor to Mother Bethel, my house was in Palmyra, New Jersey. So I could have driven to Mother Bethel every day, 10-minute drive, because I was pastoring in Camden before that. But I told my wife, we're going to move to Philadelphia because I don't want anybody telling me that I don't have a right to say. So we pay taxes, my children are public schools, that, this, that you work for us. But politicians nowadays don't see it that way. In fact, most of them think they work for special interests. As we continued the fight with the airport campaign, we saw that become crystal clear in city council. Um, we had uh, champions, so we thought, who were going to take up our fight and had agreed to stand with us and to stand with workers who also agreed it's horrible that people are getting paid that. And, and uh, it's just terrible. And mind you, let me just say, the total economic impact of giving them a raise to $12 an hour at that time would have been about $12 million a year. $12 million a year. We're talking about a $6 billion project. And what we simply said to council is, do not agree to the expansion at the airport unless you get concessions from the carriers to take care of the workers. And they said, well, they're not our workers. They're subcontracted out because we don't hire them anymore directly. We just pay the subcontractors. And so we say, well, that's just a cop out. So you pay the subcontractors more then and stop starving them out so they starve out the people. That's all we're asking. And so council agreed, and I mean, our champions went in for us, and I mean, they just, you know, came to one of our rallies. We had 3,000 people turn out at a rally, and they came and pumped up the crowd and told us what they're going to do. And the day of the, of the vote, now, I missed it. I was in New York that day, but I'm getting text messages. They were feverish from the folk from power who were there sitting in the balcony looking down. And they said, man, you're not going to believe what we're looking at. U.S. Air lobbyists are working the council right now as we speak. As other stuff is happening, I'm, we're watching them go from member to member. And all of a sudden, our champion became a traitor. And instead of the vote going our way, it was soundly, resoundedly defeated. Now, we didn't give up. I mean, as you all know, I mean, there was a, became a ballot measure. And thank God we ran into Wilson Good Jr. when he was still on council. And um, with his help and with his leadership and council steering it through and uh, with us pushing from the outside, there was actually an election uh, last year or so. And so now, I mean, that, that wage has gone up to $12 plus an hour. And soon it'll be $15 an hour as it gradually increases and goes up. But I want to just you know, under, help you understand and underscore as we talk about dem expanding democracy in this age of polarization and resistance, that often the people that you think are going to be most interested in it, the people who are elected to serve us democracy, don't have much interest in it. There's too much money at stake. And so lest we think of lobbyists only as a Washington, D.C. problem, I suggest you look in your own backyard and in your own city. It doesn't have to just be Philadelphia, but special interests work all the time. That's the lesson we learned. We thought we could do this part-time. I actually worked, I, you know, I'm an unpaid intern for power. 
<laughs> like many of the clergy. We spend 30 or 40 hours a week doing things for power that we don't get paid for because what we have learned is that those persons that are trying to contract rather than expand democracy work all the time. And they've got budgets that can keep people working when they are asleep. So it's not just politics. You know, I mean, think about our public utilities. I, I was, so where are the, any equate folk here? And, and uh, are your folk walking this week with, yeah. yeah. I was there at the kickoff for the 100-mile for the walk for green jobs uh, and, you know, green jobs for black and brown people. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, I mean, I got up on a Monday morning. Rabbi Julie Greenberg said, Reverend Mark, I need you there at 8 a.m. I said, Rabbi Julie, I have three services on Sunday. You know, for, for uh, you know, she's a rabbi. She's off on Sunday. I said, I, you know, I, Monday is my off day. And I said, 8 a.m., I got to get up early to take my kids to school. I said, whatever, all right, I'll be there. But I was so grateful that I attended. Because one of the things that they said in, the, in that moment that really just, I don't I mean, I knew this before, but it just resonated, that to hear them speak of this public utility that is not interested in solar power, that is not interested in, in, in trying to preserve the earth, and when you step back, so very often our, our public utilities don't act like public utilities. They act like private corporations. They act like it's their energy. It, they act like it's their business. I mean, in fact, I don't know whose interest they're representing, but very often it's not the public. And it's not the public good. And so as we talk about you know, expanding democracy, I understand why somebody would be like the first barber and throw up their hands when you look at the things that are going on around us. I mean, think about policing today. We sat at a table with some high-ranking police officials, some of us from uh, Power and Black Lives Matter uh, and some other young activists. Uh, about a year or two ago, we sat down with some decision makers in the police department. And as we continued to talk, one of the young people asked, he said, how do you go about making policy? What's the process? Who's involved in it? And um, so the, the officer, the, you know, this, this, this high-ranking officer started telling us how the policy is made. And the young person pushed back and said, we want to help make that policy. And the officer kind of brushed him off and went on. And I jumped in. I said, wait a minute. I said, he just said something. I said, why can't you envision you know, civilians and citizens at the table with you? Listen to what he said to me. He said, now, you know, I, I'm all for community involvement, is what he said. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm all for surveys and, and talking to the community and getting feedback and all of this. He said, but uh, civilians, they're not going to be at the table at the roundhouse making policy with us. The roundhouse, that's our headquarters, Philadelphia police. And I said, why not? He said, well, that just doesn't happen. So I said, officer, let me just ask you a question. Um, who's giving you authority to police in the first place? Where does your authority for arresting people come from? And he thought about it, and I said, I mean, no, really, where does it come from? I said, we, the government, have given you our consent to arrest us, to police us, to, you know, to detain us. You do that because we've given you consent. In fact, we've even given you a hefty budget to do it. And we let you ride around in all those new cars and all the guns and bullets and all the toys you play with, that's our stuff. And the policy that you write, you implement not on one another because you all don't hold yourselves accountable to it. You, you use it on us. And so why shouldn't the customer have a say in how the policy is made? Now, he didn't have a good answer. He just kind of, because probably nobody's ever asked him the question before. You, but, but the fact that we had the nerve to even say we want to be at the table helping to write policy and somehow there's something wrong with us for asking as though people who've been stopped and frisked don't have ideas about how to do stops better. <laughs> as though people who've lost their children to police violence don't have some kind of say about how you ought to interact with the public. I said to him, I've been stopped since I was 13 years old. I've got a PhD, I'm 50 years old, and I still get stopped. 
So I know something about police community relations. And I think that many of us have something we can add to this conversation. Now, I'll give the current commissioner credit for this. Commissioner Ross and I, you know, we differ on a lot of stuff. But I give him credit on this. When they came with the body cam policy, now we've been, we've been doing a two-year body camera experiment in Philadelphia uh, in the 22nd Police District, and they came to the um, city council to actually make a report and to tell us how things had been going. Um, and as he was making his report, um, after it was over, some of us, myself and a couple of the younger activists, caught him in the hallway on, our way, on his way out. And it was a great, you know, one of those conversations impromptu. And I said, hey, Commissioner, um, you should do a real roundtable conversation with groups like ours and talk about developing the body cam policy as a community effort. And it could be something we can take to every part of the city, because every part of the city has a different issue with body cameras. And I said, man, it'll be incredible. And first he kind of pushed back, and he pushed back, and he pushed back. And then maybe about three or four weeks later, he hit me up and he said, you know what? You all give me a list of names. And he said, no media, because we want to have a real conversation. No grandstanding. He said, and we will have that conversation about body cam policies. So that's on the table right now. But I want to say to you that that stuff doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen unless you push, unless you make people upset because of the questions that you ask. So we're talking about expanding democracy. So let me just uh, move on, because I'll see that, uh, again, this is not like a sermon. Sermons, I would know where I am right now. So see, I've been up here for quite a while. But the, just telling it? Okay, John. All right. So I'm a, I'm a half, I'm glass half full person by nature. I can't help it. I'm just an optimistic person. And so even in a negative circumstance, I have to tell you that I always see the glass half full. And so even in this moment of uh, democracy shrinking faster than glaciers in the Glacier National Park, uh, I want to say to you that for me, I see tremendous opportunity. Um, driving to Mother Bethel Church, which is on 6th Street in Lombard, come visit sometime. We have a full museum. We give tours every day. Almost every morning I pass Independence Hall. And I have to tell you that because I love history, uh, the documentaries I do, John, are mostly historical. Because I love history, I can't ever look at that building without thinking about what happened inside. And even though when they were in there arguing for freedom and democracy, they weren't thinking about folk that looked like me. They weren't necessarily thinking of women. They weren't, I mean, so it was a very narrow idea and focus of what democracy was. Yet, that is still the birthplace of what we come to argue about this weekend. And as I drive by, what I often think about is that democracy in America did not start because, you know, the king in England woke up one morning with a big heart and said, you know, we just treat these folk in the colonies so bad. We just need to try to just, we, we, need, a, we need to, you know, do colonization 2.0. Let's, <laughs> let's give them democracy. Let's take our foot off their necks and let's be kind to them. Let's stop taxing them. Let's give them full representation. That is not the story. And I don't have to tell you what the story is. But what gave rise to the story is that it was fertile ground for what creates democracy. Oppression is fertile ground for what grows democracy. If I wanted to grow democracy and I was looking for somewhere to put the seed in the ground, I'd look for a time like 2017. This is fertile ground for democracy. Anytime you have a president that has the audacity to run on a campaign and publicly says that I will stop any Muslim from coming in simply because of their religion and then seeks to implement it, that's fertile ground for democracy. And so we don't have to go look for it. In fact, many, I know I'm preaching to the choir because most of you have probably been out there for a very long time. And if you were organizing like me in the late 80s or the 90s, you remember how apathetic folk were and why they looked at you like you were crazy. Why are you protesting the first Gulf War? We should be over there. I mean, just, I mean just, there was just no sense of connection. But today we live in a time where even soccer moms are out protesting. 
No, I mean, really. But it's not by accident, but it is because the threat against democracy is so great that it has forced us into a moment where people are waking up. And that's the first thing I want to say. So what I want to say, let me give you three practical steps, and then we can have a conversation. Three things that I think you have to do if we're talking about being serious about expanding democracy. And the first is this. It's kind of where I just left off. It's what the young folks say, that you've got to stay woke, right? That you have to stay awake. And that, there's, that there can't be any napping if you want to keep democracy alive. We have to view even the slightest threat against democracy as though it is the greatest threat. Because you don't get to a Donald Trump overnight. There, there are moments that continue to creep in and to creep in where little things are taken away little bit by little bit until you look around and almost everything is gone. So you have to stay woke. That's the first thing. The second one is this that we have to understand that our fights are interrelated. Um, that, that, I'm telling you, this, this interconnectedness of our struggle has to be understood. Now, prior to uh, November 9th, 2016, uh, I remember the struggle that we had trying to get various organizations to work together, but everybody felt my issue is the greatest issue and uh, we don't like power and power doesn't like this group and so nobody wanted to work together. But after November 9th, <laughs> people were on speed dial with one another because we recognize that while um, what restroom somebody uses might not be your issue, it's related to you. Because if, if one community can be pushed aside and marginalized, then every community can be pushed aside and marginalized. We, we are so connected um, that uh, Martin Niemöller, that famous Lutheran pastor who survived uh, Nazi Germany um, by the grace of God, remembered painfully that because he was a Lutheran preacher and he had privilege as a Lutheran German preacher, that, that Nazism didn't come for him until it was too late. That's why he has that famous quote, you know, first they came for the Jews, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Catholic, I was a Protestant. They came for the union folk, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't in the union. They came for the communists, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak. And, and unless we want that to be the epitaph on our tombstones, then we have to understand the interconnectedness of our struggle. The final thing is this, that democracy um, is not a noun. It's a verb. In my church, uh, I talk about faith in the same way. Because I find that people think that faith is something you say, not something you do. And they get it mixed up. So I always talk about faith is a verb. Love is a verb. And I want to suggest to you that democracy is a verb. And in the Bible, it talks about uh, faith in this way as a verb. It says you have to exercise your faith. And what that means is, you, you know what exercise is? We don't do it enough, but we know what it is, right? <laughs> Cardio, walking, running, riding the bike, swimming, hiking, doing something that, that gets your blood moving and to exercise to keep yourself in shape. And, and I want to suggest to you that because we have forgotten that democracy is a verb and that's something that has to be exercised on a regular basis, that our democracy has gotten overweight, it's gotten slow, and it's out of shape. It's almost dead. In fact, uh, many of us don't take exercise serious until we have a health crisis. Something sends us to the emergency room, and the doctor tells us, if you don't exercise, you're going to die. And I'm telling you that in the moment we are living in, this ought to be a wake-up call for everybody that says to us that if we don't exercise our democracy, we're going to die. And that's not hyperbole. That before you know it, we won't have democracy if we don't exercise it. And so I want to say, you got to exercise your democracy. How do you exercise it? I mean, do simple stuff first. Like, you know, somebody, you don't start off with a marathon. You start off walking. Go to city council meetings. 
Go to your town hall meeting. I'm telling you just some basic things. Become familiar with how democracy where you live works. Make them know your face and make them afraid of your face. <laughs> I mean, really. They got enough people who pat them on the back and tell them how great they are. They don't need anybody else. I tell them that all the time. I'm like, I don't care if the mayor never calls me for anything. That's not why he's mayor, to be made, to, be, to feel you know, good about himself. You're mayor to work for us. And working for 1.5 million people shouldn't be easy. And it's not going to be, uh, you know, roses every day. You knew that before you took the job. You were in council. You saw, I mean, so that's not my job. So to exercise my democracy, then I'm going to show up so that folk know me. And I'm not going to be a stranger when I walk in City Hall. You don't have to tell me where the council chambers are. Because I exercise. <laughs> and I know where it is. You don't have to tell me how to get to Harrisburg and, and where the chambers are. Because I exercise. And so all of us, we have to, I'm telling you, we have to put democracy to work. And we have to exercise it or it's going to have a heart attack. And we might not be able to recover. Now, the good news about exercise and being out of shape, as all of you all know, is that even when you get out of shape, uh, if you work hard enough, you can get yourself back into shape. And so my hope and prayer is that as you talk this week, uh, and John, you, would, you kind of alluded to this as you started talking about putting you know, feet to this uh, in your opening remarks, that, that you'll leave this place trying to think of ways that you can exercise democracy in such a way that democracy will be expanded even in an age of polarization. What better time than now? to try to build and expand democracy. As the young folks say out on the protest lines, this is what democracy looks like. So thank you all very much. So um, I, I figure out, I hope I left enough time for a few questions. Um, I'd love to hear what you're thinking, um, if any of that resonates with you. Thank you very much. Because we are on uh, live streaming, um, I would invite friends to uh, be recognized so that uh, uh, I can bring you the microphone. And if you hold it right under your lower lip like this, you'll be heard by not only the people in the room who might be hard of hearing, but you'll probably be heard by the folks that are listening from their homes this evening. Great. Thank you so much for a very provocative talk. I'm sure there are comments as well as much enthusiasm. You said it wasn't a sermon, but if a sermon is meant to inspire and move, you did. So thank you so much. I'm, you. I'm glad that you were able to step in. I should mention that Reverend Gregory Holston, who couldn't be with us tonight because his daughter was um, who's getting her PhD tomorrow, was voted the best scholar in her class. And so he had to go to an honoring banquet tonight. <laughs> so we're very happy that you were able to take his place, but that's a good reason. Yeah, that's a good absolutely. reason to ask someone to substitute. Yeah. Are there questions or comments that are resonating? I know you might need to take a moment or two. Pamela. Right under the lip like that. Just like a preacher. <laughs> OK. Oh, thank you so much for that. It was um, wonderful. Um, I just wanted to say, well, I had a few things. But the last thing that you mentioned when you talked about um, democracy being something that you have to exercise, um, one of the things with exercise, sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zone. Mm. And so if you really want to see the change. And so when we talk about, you said this may not be your issue, mm -hmm. um, you know, that intersectionality. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of, you know, being in the space that I'm always in, mm -hmm. I would go to a space that I'm not normally in and um, use my talent or try to align myself with with those individuals or groups that I'm not necessarily in with in order to really exercise that democracy. Yeah. So it's not just my thing, it becomes our thing. Absolutely. Um, and um, 
but also they don't know you're coming, right? So mm -hmm. if they're looking at me, okay, she's that black woman that's going to talk about, you know, race and all those things, right? Mm -hmm. But if I come in and I start to talk about ableism or I t start to talk mm -hmm. about something else, it kind of throws them off. So I encourage people to get on the um, black woman bandwagon and mm -hmm. I'll jump on your bandwagon mm -hmm. and we can work <laughs> together. Um, uh. Well so I, I think that's important. But I also think that we also need to start to um, interrogate our notion of democracy mm. and mm -hmm. that it doesn't always look like the founding fathers thought it should look like. Mm -hmm. And so as we start to expand our democracy, that we also interrogate what that democracy looks like in this current climate yeah. and we're not trying to recreate because there are certain structural and systemic inequities built into that model mm -hmm. and we're not just trying to recreate that we're trying to come up with something new yeah so yeah. i think well, I mean, it's a in good that topic model, but we need to yeah. start to also expand that definition um so maybe you know you talked about um colonialism but maybe some decolonialism and maybe some decolonializing democracy because mm -hmm. there's some inherent um, deficiencies in that model. Yeah, so I would say this that, you know, t just to your last point, I agree with uh, everything you said that, um, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about this is that this is our country and we can make it what we want. So, I mean, if, so, so even though those, those founders, gave us something that was absolutely incomplete and um, exclusive and not inclusive. Uh, what they left in there was something that can be changed and pushed and altered. And so, but, but that only happens when people push at it, you know? And I mean, and that's why, I mean, I'm just a firm believer in, you know, in pushing. And, um, and to your other point, you're right. I mean, you have to be willing to get out of your own space. Uh, my work with power has taken me into places that I would have never gone on my own. And, um, and you're right, sometimes it makes you uncomfortable, uh, but there's always some deep learning as a result of it. And um, so thank you for, uh, for sharing, Pamela. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna just, just piggyback on that because I can't resist in discussing our title we we did talk about it being creating democracy and so part of what we're going to be working on this weekend really is messaging and so there are people myself included who think that we need to start over and there are other people who think well no we can push in the direction that will expand democracy and realize what we have promised from the get-go of the country, even when the people who are writing the promises weren't keeping them. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> just keep that, you know, just think about our theme and how you might reframe the theme in your own way. I saw a couple of hands. Um, do you want to call on people? Because I didn't see in the uh, order in the which back, they- Right there, since you're closest to her with the mic, and we'll work our way on up. Thank you. Um, this comes sort of from the first barber. Mm -hmm. Not me, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'd love to hear a more detailed description between the time that the vote in the city council went absolutely sour mm -hmm. and the time that you got it done and got mm -hmm. it and made it happen. What were some of the crucial pieces? <coughs> besides your faith and strength and persistence that made that transition happen? Yeah, so um, in fact, Reverend Holston, uh, he, he was one of the co-leaders of our economic dignity team. So that was that team's work. We have three teams, uh, education, which is trying to get a fair funding. Well, we actually, the fair funding formula conversation in the state now, we put that, we even put that language on the table. Nobody's even saying, they weren't even saying it. They don't, um, yeah, now, I mean, they're only funneling the new money through the formula. But, but you know, so education at that time is where I was working. Uh, we now have a new one, Live Free, which is about mass incarceration, ending it, and all things related to policing, et cetera. So Reverend Holston was a part of the economic dignity team. And I heard him talking about this um, 
just the other day, I can't, sometime this week we were somewhere, and what he said is that the, that day, like I said, I wasn't there because I was somewhere else, but that day, he said they walked out of there and went across the street to Arch Street United Methodist, which is one of our congregations, Reverend Heineke. And he said they just sat there really like shell-shocked because, I mean, we were, we were promised this. It was a done deal. And, I mean, it just it completely rocked everybody to the core because, I mean, we just, it was the first time we really got played that way. And, I mean, it was, it was big. Um, and we had so much riding on it, and um, our other affiliates around the country were looking at this. We, we had all this celebration planned. And so um, initially, I mean, honestly, people were just kind of thinking maybe we should just let the airport piece go. It's not going to happen. Um, you know, there was a lot of doubt you know, heavy within the organization about, um, you know, because pe a lot of people weren't necessarily crazy about the airport to begin with, you know, from the very beginning. We, some people, you know, a lot of people were lobbying for education first, but all our resources went there first. So they regrouped that team and the, con and I don't really know, maybe it was the, maybe it was losing that vote that brought our, us to Wilson Good's attention. I don't know if Wilson Good Jr. came to us first or if we went to him, but we didn't really know him that way. And so he was not the person we had as a champion. And so a relationship developed with Wilson and, you know, we did we just had no idea how committed to social justice and economic justice he was. I mean, he was just, and it's such a loss that he's not in council now. You know, he lost the reelection, and um, some people tend to think that might have been a price he paid for getting so close to us. Uh, they lost some support among his own colleagues. But uh, Wilson kind of showed us some things we didn't understand about council. And so let me just tell you, so by the time, you know, every, by the time things started lining up toward uh, putting this as a referendum, for the public to vote on, and who in Philadelphia is not gonna vote for higher wages for workers, right? I mean, initially we only went at the airport. Now this was, it was about to be citywide. Any, because the loophole was, uh, there was already a, a minimum, uh, a minimum that you could pay contracted workers and subcontracted, but sub subcontracted were exempted by it. So it was like two layers down, you know. And so, so by the time we got ready to, I'm telling you, by the time we got ready to make this happen and it looked like everything was going to happen, Mayor Nutter at that time ran out in front of it and passed the executive order making it so. <laughs> Which we all kind of laughed at. It's like, okay. It invited us to the sign and we were like, all right. I mean, we all sat in the back of the sign just laughing like this is really a trip. Right? You know, he's weeping and he's signing it. We're all just saying that this is amazing, but okay, we'll take it. And so the executive order went in first and then it was still on a ballot referendum. And so the ballot referendum then passed and made it law. Now, I will say this as well. That's why I'm talking about staying woke and exercise and keeping those two kind of in your mind. Even after it passed, a number of the vendors at the airport refused to give them a raise. And they maintained that they were under a contract that was signed before the law changed and that they didn't have to change the wages, even though the law said it must happen immediately. And for, and for months, their lawyers lobbied. Now, look, think of all the money they're spending on lawyers. Instead of just paying people $5 more an hour. How stupid is that? But for them, they didn't want to pay. So they kept this up for months until finally they were forced into actually doing something. But that, con that, that was continued um, pressure. Fast forward a little bit more to last summer when the uh, DNC came to the city. The last hurdle was the folk wanted to unionize. And so they wanted to unionize with SEIU, who had been the labor partner from the beginning. So that was the other piece I didn't mention. We had partnered with SEIU uh, from the very beginning. So whenever they had an action, we were always there. So the word would go out, power clergy, you know, lay people, if you can make it, they're going to have an action at the airport, you know, show up. And so at the last minute, uh, American now, who had taken over, um, said they just weren't going to, you know, they weren't going to do anything to help with this, with the union issue. So several of us clergy were told we were supposed to have a meeting with American. We get there. There was no meeting scheduled. I don't even know who said that. Somebody in our group just said that. So they get us down there thinking there's a meeting. 
we looking like fools trying to get through TSA. No, we have a meeting in there. Like, you're not on, we don't see anything in there about a meeting with power. <laughs> Who are you? So we realized there's no meeting. So we sat in, literally, in Terminal B. We just sat down and blocked the access into the checkpoint. And so the cops were looking like, well, what are you guys doing? I mean, this was not planned. It was not staged. But we knew this is the Sunday before the DNC. The last thing you want is, is and so we said, and if we don't get what we want, when we come back tomorrow, we're bringing our congregations with us. And so we're sitting out there, man, they're like moving pylons, like, all right. So we move over there, and they're like, oh, God. So I mean, for an hour, this goes on. Some of the civil affairs cops, are, who are great, by the way, I, I love them. Because I mean, they just, and so they come, all right, they're like, OK, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a warning. And in 15 minutes, we have to give you a second warning. 15 more minutes, we give you one more. And then if you don't move, we have to walk you down, arrest you, and take you down, and check you in, book you, then release you. And so that, so that's what happened. But as a result of that, American, you know, gave in and gave them what they wanted. And the folk voted to unionize. It was unanimous a month ago. So I mean, it's, that's a six or seven year story. And, and one thing I left out, which I just want to say, I know it's getting late, but I have to tell you this. The, our first action at the airport, maybe one of our first actions, was a silent prayer walk through the terminals in our clergy regalia. Yeah, I mean, at the time, you know, we weren't crazy about it. You know, you, mean, <laughs> you, know, you want me to wear my robe? And here's, so luckily, I missed the first part because the first part was actually through City Hall, to the, through council chambers to tell them where we were going. And they went in actually praying over council people, praying that they'll do the right thing. <laughs> the council was so mad. And then they got on SEPTA and rode the train to the airport. Now, I had a funeral, so I just had to meet him at the airport. But I've seen the video, and I was like, man. So we're walking through the airport, silent. And I remember looking up at, this was at the terminal uh, D had just, D and E was just built, the new terminal. And it's huge. You don't really know how big it is. But we're walking through, and I'm looking at all that glass. And I was thinking, like, man, this is like David and Goliath. This thing is huge. How are we going to bring, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking, I know it's going to happen, but how is this going to happen? And we're doing a silent march. And we got all these weird looking robes on and the prayer shawls and the caps and yarmulkes. And so the people in the airport looked at us and they were like, oh, I think they're from another country. <laughs> <laughs> this is what democracy looks like. <laughs> all right, uh, there's another question right there, uh, the gentleman right there. Yeah, oh, there's a mic, John. And then right here in the front. Yeah, uh, it's been fun. I'm gonna tell you, hanging out with power is definitely fun. You have some stories when it's over. Uh. Wow, Th thanks for all these wonderful <laughs> stories. Uh, uh, you almost maybe want to ask a different question than I originally wanted to ask, but uh, I, I have a real concern about the kind of 1984 moment that we're mm -hmm. in, where up is down and black is mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. I read a headline in the New York Times, I think just today, that said most uh, people that supported Trump still support him Oof. in his latest move with, with Comey. And uh, I just wanted you to maybe give us your thoughts on uh, all the, the kind of uh, contradictions and outright lying mm -hmm. and painting of reality uh, to be completely different from what it really is that's going on. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, um, I wrote on Facebook just one word with the Comey article attached. Uh, I'd say gratitude. Um, and people, I don't know if people really understood what I was saying, but, you know, I was saying this is, I'm sure Comey is thinking, you know, th this is how you show gratitude. <laughs> you know what I mean? I actually made you president by my one sided approach toward what I chose to, we all know now that the Trump campaign has been under investigation, people within the campaign, for as long as he was looking at Hillary Clinton's emails. But he decided not to talk about that, ever. And so that's all come out, and that's what I'm thinking, like, you know, I guess you, you know, you fixed yourself, right? So, but, but in this moment, um, I mean, listen, people are, some people are just going to be locked in to their position no matter what. And to be honest with you, it, the way I feel ab about this moment and why people refuse to, to believe anything different is because for many people, what Donald Trump represents, it, it's not about the policy. This, this is what a lot of Democrats and his Republican uh, opponents missed. 
that he tapped into the ugliest part of America, the part that has not changed, the, the spirit that was alive that, that created the Civil War, the spirit that was alive that thought the Fugitive Slave Act was a good idea, the spirit that was alive that said women should not vote. I mean, that, 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 that ugliest part of you know, who we are as Americans, he tapped into it. And for them, they know he's lying. But that's not the point. He's their champion. And so with him, they know that they can get what they want, which is get these black and brown people out. And I mean, I was saying to some folk the other day that, you know, that if it wasn't so unpopular, instead, it wouldn't just be go back to Mexico and Muslims stay out. It'd be go back to Africa because that was just 50 years ago. Right. You know, where you could say that publicly as though if I went back, I would know where to go to begin with. But, you know, but, but he has tapped into that. And so there's nothing he can do to lose that group except abandon his commitment to that. And so it's code words, you know, it's dog whistles. It is a, it is a conversation that, you know, for a lot of people of color, they don't hear it. Now, you know, um, I grew up in East Oakland, California, in my neighborhood, which was all black, all my friends went to public school, but my mom put me in Catholic school because she just thought at that time, that's what you do if you want your kid to get a better education. You know, that's what she thought. And so um, whether that's true or not, but that, that was her approach. She didn't have the money for it. She was a single parent. And so she worked overtime every day to keep me in that school. Now, because of that experience, I went to school with mostly white people, but I lived in a mostly black experience. So I had a chance through my growing up from third grade through high school to actually learn both worlds and become fluent in both. So a lot of people of color don't. That's what I'm saying. It's like, man, you know, I don't know if you can hear what he's saying, but he's not talking to us. You know, these conversations around, you know, protecting us, all that is not for us to digest. That's not, our, that's not aimed at us. And that's why I said that I do not think he can do anything. I absolutely believe he is right when he said, I can walk in Times Square, shoot somebody, and people would still vote for me. And they would. If you can get elected president in this country after having the Access Hollywood tape come out, think about this. Gary Hart, where is he? What happened to him? Just, we didn't even hear the conversation. It's just, oh, this is what he did. Oh, God, that's horrible. Yeah, it's like, when have you ever heard that level of detail come out the mouth of a candidate for president and you don't lose support? Because it doesn't matter what he does. Because he is there to serve a different purpose. It is to put all of us in check and to make things right again, you know. Um, so I'm so but again, thankfully, that's still a minority. I think that he is, um, you know, talking about the election. I was a supporter of Hillary Clinton and, you know, I've worked on the campaign. You know, a lot of missteps. Pennsylvania, you know, me and one of an older rabbi, we met with the campaign people two, three weeks before the election. We were like, please do something different here. They're like, ah, we got it together. Pennsylvania's done. We we're like, no, it's not. It's like, it is not. And they're like, ah, you know, don't worry about you guys. No, we got numbers. All right, well. So, I, you know, different candidate he probably wouldn't be in, but he's in now, and it's hard to beat an incumbent. So, you know, so there's a question right here in the front. That's my political analysis of this moment. So, first of all, uh, I applaud the activism and the political organizing of power. And I really applaud Thank you. Uh, what you've done over a longer period of time and the way in which you've stayed together. And I understand now you're reaching out to the suburbs to organize them as well. Yeah, Power Metro is organized congregations. And we have two uh, paid organizers who are organizing in the center of the state. So they're Very actually good. convening. Yeah, so they got a new table because we, we know you can't win in Harrisburg unless you have people who are in those you know, deep red districts to push within their own district. So yeah, so it is continuing so is to push. As is, is one of our local state reps said, Bill, the issue is not Republicans versus Democrats right. in Harrisburg. It's Southeast Pennsylvania right. versus the rest of the state. That's right. So, so my question, for, and the other thing is, um, 
I, in my activism, really encourage people, wherever they are, to know where the local democratic organization is and what they're doing and what they need in order to be successful mm -hmm. to, to turn this around. My concern, it, the issue that I want to raise with you, because I need help f dealing with my own um, concern, and that is Citizens United mm -hmm. and the amount of money mm -hmm. that is being coalesced into actions, political actions, <laughs> that are uh, controlling uh, so many of the, the local races. Mm. And, and what I don't know is, is to what is a, an effective response to that. Mm -hmm. I can't out, I can't out money them or out raise them. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and it is also difficult to disclose who they are. So I'm, I'm wondering, in your experience in doing all the work that you've done, how you deal with that aspect of yeah. the political life we're in. Well, listen, I mean, <laughs> this is America. And um, I don't know that you can ever get money out of politics. I just don't. I mean, there's so many. You, you stop it here at Citizens United. They'll find another way. I mean, money is it's, it's what people use. But... I mean, think about how much money Hillary Clinton had. She still lost. Um, Jeb Bush had more money than all the other. I mean, that everybody with money that's Republican was lined up behind Jeb Bush when the Republican primary started. I mean, Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump would have had to spend. I mean, a lot of his own money, and yet Jeb Bush just got ran over like everybody else. And so, money didn't save them. So I think that while I would agree with you that money is absolutely a problem within, uh, within our current um, election cycle, and it would be a good thing to get rid of, you know, to overturn that and uh, to find new ways or regulations to, to make it more difficult for, for money to come in, without, especially without people knowing where it comes from. But, you know, they're, they're, they're liberal folk on the other side, progressive people who dump money. I mean, Soros is throwing money in Philly right now, right? So, I mean, so... You know, I mean, is it just the money? I think it goes back to something even more fundamental, which is, and that's why I ended with the, the idea of exercising democracy. So when I talk to people today, you know, people are calling me as we get close to the DA race. Now our district attorney is under now about 50 indictments. No, I mean, seriously, that's, and that's painful for me because I know Seth very well, we're fraternity brothers. So I take no joy or delight in what's happening to him. He's up, but he is up to almost 50 indictments and just chosen not to run again. This is right now prosecutor races around the country. Uh, if you kind of follow the progressive circles, uh, about a year ago, many of us decided we're going to make DA races the, the thing because that's where sentencing happens. That's where, I mean, a lot of stuff happens if you get the right or wrong district attorney. That said, as high profile as the DA race is, I cannot tell you how many people call me now on a regular basis, who should I vote for? I mean, you don't, they don't even know the candidates. It's like, how can you not know the district, district attorney candidate in Philadelphia in the Black Lives Matter movement moment? I mean, really, you talking about you care about mass incarceration and you don't know who to vote for by now and it's less than a week before the primary. So you've not taken the time to actually study the candidates, to know them, to know the differences, to know who's backing which candidate, where that money is coming from, you know, who, who's endorsing, who, who wants this one, who does the FOP want? Because I sure don't want that person. I mean, I don't want anybody but the one the FOP says. That's just me. And, and yet... And so I'm saying to, to you that, to me, that is a greater threat than all the money pouring in. Because the money only works when people are ignorant. If you are woke, I don't care how much money you dump in telling me that this guy is a bad person. I already know better than that. And in fact, I know why you're putting money in. Because you want this person, and because I know who you are, he, you know, this person getting elected, he or she will do your bidding. But that's what it means to be to be woke. And, you know, and it can't just be when there's a presidential election, when it's sexy. And that's what we do. You know, the vast. I mean, listen, I guarantee you, sadly, that although we have a million voters, a million registered voters in Philadelphia, the DA's race on Tuesday and while we're electing judges, 
will likely only turn out 100,000 people. That is sinful. Now, I can't speak for anybody else, but, you know, my mother was born without the right to vote in Arkansas in 1933. And she's still alive, and so, you know, tells me the horror story. So, I'm, so I mean, I was born in 66, barely with the right to vote, you know, shortly after the Voting Rights Act. And so I say to, to black people, like, how in the world can you not vote? But it's not just an American phenomenon. If you follow what's happening in South Africa today, there was a great story two years ago. In South Africa today, young people who are 18 to 20, early 20s, are saying that they are not going to vote anymore. Voting don't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. Like, good Lord, are you kidding? I mean, I remember crying when Nelson Mandela came out of jail. I was not even South African. And so now here, just a half a generation after Mandela and people are not voting. We get lazy. Exercise, I'm telling you, does anybody here like to exercise? Just raise your hand. You like to. How many, you are the minority in this room. No, nobody likes to exercise. I mean, a few people, you know, it's your thing. But I mean, the, most people who do it, do it because they just kind of have to. You don't want to die. <laughs> so you make yourself do it. But it's not like you just wake up like, man, I can't wait to exercise. My wife gets up at 5 in the morning and runs. I'm like, man, I'll walk you to the door make sure you get in the car, right? But <laughs> I'm going back to bed. You gotta, I mean, that's, to me, that's the answer. More than the money. Yes, one last question here over here. Oh, I see two right there. John. Well, right here, and then uh, over on the other side. I think I figured out how to frame this. Okay, exercise. Um, but I don't know what the tools are and where the gym is. Uh -huh. So, so um, I know there is a Democratic Party in Chester. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to how, how to get at them. Uh -huh. I know that there are rules about voting and um, poll watching and all that. Mm -hmm. My husband knew them and he's no longer around, so mm -hmm. I don't know that. And where do I go to look? I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. I think this is a huge problem. When I read that um, we're, there's a, Republicans are throwing out Obamacare because the insurance company is going broke, mm -hmm. I don't see any information in the press about insurance companies and what's going on. Mm -hmm. So what can we do about that? That is so yeah. huge. So you can organize right where you are. I mean, first of all, listen, if, what would it look like if you, I'm assuming you're on Facebook? Yes. Right. So if you went on Facebook and just said, you know, I'm a person, I want to get involved, but I don't know what's going on. If you're like me, let's get together and figure this out and create a group that is all about understanding the local politics where you live. There are a lot of people who will show you, but, you know, again, we don't usually tap into them. In Philly, it's the Committee of 70. I mean, if you don't know the... Right, but I mean, but again, I guarantee you there's something or there's someone who knows the system. And usually, they're like, you know, archivists in libraries, the people that nobody ever looks for until you really need something. And they're like sitting back all dusty and just like, well, nobody ever bothers me. And it's like, you know, would you show us how the politics work in Chester? Man, I tell you, you probably won't get them to, you won't be able to stop them from talking. I'm telling you, because they'll be so happy that somebody wants to know, right? No, I know how it's worked. Right. Well, well, here's the other thing. So let me say this, that I am not, I am a registered Democrat, but I am not a fan necessarily of the way in which the Democratic Party operates. And, you know, in my city, uh, you know, it's, it's a small controlled group and you've got to go to them to get the blessing, to get the endorsement and all of this. And I'm saying, I don't know whose interests you are, who you're supporting because you never talk to us. And I know we're out here and I know other groups that are progressive and activist groups. And y all, y all have, you've not spoken to them. So what, how, what are you basing your decision on endorsing about? So, it, so these parties become very insular. And let me tell you, Democratic Party and Republican Party, the, the party leadership from the local to the federal level are interested and deeply invested in low voter turnout because they can control things. If next week 200,000 people instead of 100,000 people show up, I'm telling you the Democratic Party in Philadelphia would be going crazy because they wouldn't know where those votes came from. You know, I ran for an um, office in our denomination once. And, uh, you know, church denominations can sometimes be very political. Um, 
Somebody say amen. Uh, and uh, it was a national. It was a national office uh, to be the church historiographer. And um, and, you know, I was running against a guy who had been an incumbent for like 20, 24 years that nobody had ever even gotten more than 100 votes against. And it's like 1,500 votes cash. You have to get 50 plus one. And so I waged this campaign on a low budget, but I was using social media, all kind of stuff. And I had support from everywhere. And, you know, I came within striking distance of winning. I mean, I, I think he had maybe like Maybe it was like, let's just say it was like 700 something votes to like almost 600 and some odd votes. It was very close, way closer than anybody thought. I'm not the son of a bishop. Uh, I'm not like in some kind of like real popular AME family. There was no massive organization. I just, I went to people in the denomination and said, you know what? We need an archive. And they were like, we do. I said, we need a place to house our history. They said, we do. And I said, look at here's some pictures of where our stuff is in our colleges and universities. Did you know this is the condition it's in? They were like, oh my God, that's terrible. I said, yeah, you need to put somebody in who's going to do something. And I just started working vote after vote. I mean, I was talking to people. And I'll never forget one of the bishops up on the DS, his mic was live. And so, you know, our meetings, you know, we're, we're not as, you know, egalitarian as like the Quakers where everybody's all together. We have a huge DS with hundreds of people up there. And we got the 1,500 down here. Yeah, so it's like, you know, each level gets, you know, higher and higher. But that, but that mic was hot. And everybody recognized his voice. And he said, woo, that was close. <laughs> you know? I mean, but you know, I wasn't supposed to win. I didn't have the blessing of the system. You know, and he had endorsements, and he had people backing him. He had people with votes who would say, I give, I give you 300 votes, and I give you 100 votes, and I give you, and, other, and then bishops were kind to me. They said, listen, I mean, you know, we already committed to him, but if you do well, you know, we'll come and get you. Now, luckily, I didn't win, because as a result, the guy who was at Mother Bethel got elected bishop at that same meeting, and I ended up pastor Mother Bethel. So I think I won, but I mean, it's, <laughs> like, I am not complaining. But, it, but, but listen, I'm going to tell you, that's a church story. But it is so very applicable to what happens out here. Yes. And that you can change the system, but I mean, it's a lot of work. But it can happen. Yeah. Thank you. And there's one last question over there, John. And I'm going to get out your way. I had a reaction. Um, a body reaction when I heard you say towards the end of your first statement that this is our country. Mm -hmm. um, as a black woman, um, my experience growing up in the 50s and 60s and my continuing experience right now, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. What can I say to other black and brown people mm -hmm. who understand the ancestry, the history of our coming to this country mm -hmm. and being systematically and systemically um, oppressed, mm -hmm. marginalized, I heard somebody suggest, how can I, for myself and for others, find a place where this is my country? Mm. Yeah, um, I wish I could pull that quote up right now. Um, so thank you for that question, and, and I feel you. You know, it's um, W.E.B. Du Bois said that for black people in America, it's a double consciousness. You know, to be black and to be Negro is what he said. I'm mean, sorry, to be, to be Negro and to be American, um, that it's this, you kind of almost like having these, this split personality, you know. Fourth of July rolls around, everybody's celebrating, but then there's that part of you is like, you know, what the hell am I celebrating for? I mean, it's this, so there is this, I, I get that. Um, this morning, um, and John, thank you alluded to my documentary work, so I also often appear in other people's work. You know, we support each other. Um, and so there's a new documentary that a group is working on called Daring Women. Uh, it's gonna be really powerful. Talking about um, women in Philadelphia, primarily around the 1830s. I'm talking about like, you know, social justice minded women and abolitionists, anti-slavery. Um, I mean, just a fantastic documentary. So they asked me to talk and give a little bit of um, the background about the early free black community in Philadelphia. And so she wanted me to talk about the American Colonization Society. Uh, anybody know about that? Yes. You all, anybody not know about it? So, um, so the ACS, 
uh, American Colonization Society uh, was started in 1816, I believe, and their goal was, they, so this was their answer to the race problem in America. Let's create a colony in Africa and send all the free black people there. Because once we get the free black people out, then the people who are enslaved won't want to be free anymore because they won't know that they're enslaved. I mean, that's essentially what it boils down to. And these were church folk, by the way, uh, who started this. Um, many Methodists, Presbyterians, others were uh, staunch supporters of the ACS and leaders of it. In fact, George Washington's nephew was um, one of the, I think he was like the first president, if I'm not mistaken, of the ACS. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure he was. And so the American Colonization Society um, is what helped lead to the creation of the nation Liberia. And, um, and I actually did convince a number of black people who were free to leave because like you, they just felt like, you know, I'll never get a fair deal in this country. There was a huge meeting at Mother Bethel Church uh, in 1817 to debate this issue. Uh, they say 3,000 people showed up from all, these are all free blacks from across the Northeast Corridor. And they joined at, at Mother Bethel, and they heard about the plan, and they talked about it among themselves. That's the important part about having your own space, you know, that you can even have space to do this, have this conversation. Um, and at the end of the conversation, um, they rejected the plan of the American Colonization Society, branded it as something that was not in the best interest of uh, black Americans. They kind of said it's like Fox News, don't watch it. It's not, it's not for you. I mean, it's just, you know, just kind of like, don't even worry about that. Just leave it there right where it is. And um, Richard Allen, a few years later, had this to say. And, and again, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but essentially this is what he said. He, he talked about having his own internal wrestlings over the years about whether or not he should stay, whether or not he should go. He had thought about Canada at, at one point. Um, some of his descendants went to Canada later. Uh, he thought about Haiti. He actually sent missionaries to Haiti because uh, it was free at that point. Um, they didn't fare so well, so they came right back. Uh, but, and he thought about Africa, for sure. But at the end of the day, what he said is that this is our mother country now. And he said, our blood, it's been paid for with our blood and with our tears. And, and essentially, he didn't say it this way, but essentially he said, I'll be damned if somebody's going to run me out of my own country. And he said, so I'm not leaving because I paid too much to be here. And so, you know, for those who, who question about whether or not this is ours or not, I say it's ours. You know, for people who tell me, you know, I look at Donald Trump, I said, you just got here. You, your family came in the 20th century. I'll show you documentation of my family that's been here with, with proof on two sides of my family, at least since 1818. So, and they had to be born to somebody. So I'm, let's just assume since the 1700s comfortably that my family's been here. So I don't have to, you know, argue with anybody about the fact that I've been here since before there was a country. I mean, most white people in America were not here at that time. And so who, I mean, so no, whose country is it? Native Americans first. And certainly to the sons and daughters of enslaved people, second. So, you know, I mean, I'm not going to let anybody make me feel bad about, about owning it. And I'm going to do the, my, my, my level best with the time that I have to make it live up to the promise it made. We the people. I said that to the young people today when I was at the rally with them. I said, I said, I told them to repeat. I said, I said, we the people. This is your school district. The schools you attend are your schools. They're public schools. They're your, your parents have a right to know what's going on in your school and have a right to say, because we the people. It was started, that, that slogan was started in this city, a mile from where we were standing. So... You know, that, so that's my take on it. But I will admit with you that there are times, you know, being black in America, it just does make you wonder. Um, but we pay too much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. And that was a substitute. Can you believe it? <laughs> Hello. Thank you so very much. I, I, what an inspiring way to begin our time together. I just feel so honored that you are with us tonight. And I'm looking forward to working with you in the future and looking at your documentaries and hoping that you'll come back to be one of our regular speakers at Pendle Hill. Thank you so much. Friends, I would recognize that we have guests tonight who are not part of the conference. And since it's 9 o'clock, I feel as though I c could let them go. Um, I would you want to hear some more music from City Love? Um, so and I also have some like things that I wanted to do at the outset, but I felt that we had started with worship and that it was not appropriate to tell you where the bathrooms are and all of that stuff. But I do have a bit of um, orientation for those folks. So if you would kindly stay after City Love's last set, if you are part of the conference so that you can hear just a few little bits of housekeeping information that you'll probably need before tomorrow morning, okay? <laughs> well, it's 9 o'clock now. Let's have one song. We, I didn't know quite what we were going to do, but we've got wonderful folks who will give us something that's wonderful. So let's, let's listen. Thank you. Look, come, come on up. Don't believe in the impossible. Nothing will be the same with you. 
and nothing will be the same with us. And all it took was a little trust to see what we've been missing soon. To make realities from wishes, they will see. we get caught up in the logical see. and don't realize what has been possible. See. I believe in love, truth, and empathy. You will guarantee those things when you get them. I believe. I believe these words are true. I believe. Cause I believe in you. Yeah, I believe. I believe in you. And I believe. I believe our love. Bless us all one day. Oh, bless us, come with me. All right, this is the part of the night where we need a bless participation. We're going to say that you, if you're able to stand up with us, stand. If you have to remain seated, that's all good, but very simple. Very simple. You just want to turn to somebody and you're going to sing these words to them. And you're going to really believe it when you say it, because that's important. Very simple. So you're just going to tell the person next to you. I believe in you. <laughs> Alright. Say it again. I believe in you. Say it a little bit more with a little more conviction. I believe in you. And we need a little bit more faith in that statement. I believe in you. Now find another person. Find another person. And say it. Man, I'm saying, I believe in you. And we know we see some crazy stuff on the TV today, but 